Well, good evening. I'm George Kilpatrick, your host for Town Hall Number 4, our final presentation. The town halls are presented by 100 Black Men of Syracuse Incorporated as a result of the 100 Black Men of America's National Institutes of Health Morehouse School of Medicine Health and Wellness Grant. So far, we've presented three town halls, Violence Prevention, Healthcare 2.0, and COVID-19 and Brain and Mental Health. Today, our final town hall is entitled Cancer Awareness, and we have three knowledgeable presenters from SUNY Upstate Medical University, Dr. Leslie Coleman, Rachel Ryan, and Elizabeth Fuertes Ben Binder. We would like for you to put your questions in the Q&A after all three presenters are done with their presentations. So here's how it goes. Dr. Coleman will present. We'll give you about five minutes to do that, and then we'll continue as such. And then at the end, we'll have an open Q&A. We will have a short Q&A at the end. Also, we would like for you to fill out the event survey at the end of the presentation. Our topic today is cancer awareness, and our first presenter is Dr. Leslie Komen, a thoracic surgeon and palliative care physician who, has the med who was the medical director of the Upstate Cancer Center from 2010 until 2015, and has been the Upstate Cancer Center Director of Research since 2016. Dr. Coleman has been deeply involved in cancer prevention and screening activities her whole career. She served in numerous leadership positions within the American Cancer Society, both regionally and nationally. So let's begin. Dr. Leslie Coleman, welcome. Thank you, George. It's great to be speaking to you all. And I'm going to go through some of the basics of cancer and what this disease is what it can do. Then we're gonna talk about a couple of the big cancers that are very common in people and that's colorectal cancer and breast cancer. And then we'll talk a little bit about one of the newer awareness instances in cancer where we know of a virus that causes six times kinds of cancer and how to prevent it. So, this graph shows you some of the trends in cancer incidence. That is how many people get cancer and basically how many people are dying of cancer starting back from 1975 all the way up to 2015. And we see that for all categories listed here, there is a fewer number of people dying of cancer over the last 30, 45 years. The biggest improvement has been in black males, but they still remain the highest at risk for dying of cancer. White females are the lowest, but they've gone down a little bit too. So although the disparities here between white and black have gotten smaller, much smaller than they were back 25 years ago, they have in no way gone away. So the good news is that fewer people are dying of cancer than used to. The bad news is that it's not equal for all people. So how does cancer start and what kind of a disease is this? This is a normal cell with a cell boundary and this is the nucleus, which takes all the information about that cell. And then when it divides, this splits. Well, what happens is something goes wrong in the nucleus of that cell, a mutation. It can be something that just randomly happens. It can be to, due to a toxin like radon or smoking or radiation. Um, and then the cell cannot repair itself. These cells divide and you get more and more of these abnormal cells. And this is when the cancer starts. So the cancer is some cells that are buried inside of a lot of normal cells, but the cancer cells start to make chemicals and messengers and send those around the body in the bloodstream and also send the tissues around them the signal to build some more blood supply and that lets the cancer, the tumor grow. 
Cancer and tumor are basically the same word, although you can have benign tumors that are not cancerous, but all cancers are tumors. And then what happens is these cancer cells start to break off from their um, home where they began and float in the bloodstream to other parts of the body. And then they can exit the bloodstream and set up somewhere else. This is like, say, a lung cancer cell breaks off and goes to the brain and grows there. It's still lung cancer, but now it's growing in the brain. We call that a metastasis, and that's not good. So how do we treat cancer? We basically have three ways of treating cancer. We have surgery, which is the oldest and first major way of treating cancer, cut it out. That works on earlier and smaller cancers in organs that you can remove, but it doesn't work on more advanced cancer or in certain organs. We have radiation, which is the next oldest form of cancer treatment that's been going on for probably about a century. It's way more modern now than it used to be. Patients get a painless beam of radiation to treat the cancer. And this can be done in a series of daily treatments, sometimes twice a day. Sometimes it goes on for a week. Sometimes it can go on for as long as six weeks. And then we have drugs. The traditional type of cancer drug is chemotherapy, which is given in a vein through a needle in a vein or through a port that's placed into a larger vein. And then a needle goes into this little port under the skin. This is called infusion therapy. Now we have many forms of cancer drugs that are actually given by pill. They're a little different. Most of these are not traditional chemotherapy. They're something called immunotherapy, which induces the body to make its own response to fight off the cancer. So we have chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Those are the main ways we know to directly treat cancer. So what happens when we treat cancer with effective treatment? Many cancers can actually be cured and the patient will never have them again. Others can be controlled for many years, like a chronic disease. Cancer treatment has better outcome if it's found and treated early. And the best outcomes, of course, are if the cancer is actually prevented. We know that there are many, many people who survive cancer. There are over 1 million survivors of cancer in New York State alone. So what's best? The best thing to do is to get screened for those cancers we can screen for. What does that mean? Get screened means let's find cancer early. Early cancers can often be cured, and if they're found later, not so much. There are several kinds of cancer we can screen for. Breast cancer with mammograms, and Rachel will tell you more about that later. Colorectal cancer in the large intestine. There are ways to screen for that. You'll hear that also. Lung cancer, we won't talk about that today, but it's a very good topic because there are many, many people whose lives could be saved by having a routine CAT scan to look for lung cancer and uh, otherwise their cancer is growing silently. And then cervix cancer for women, a pap smear or related test can find those cancers early as well. Sometimes prostate cancer can be screened for with a blood test. This is not universal. And one of the groups that it's most important for are black men who have a higher incidence of prostate cancer than white, and especially if they have relatives who have had prostate cancer. But even better than screening, even better than finding a cancer early is to prevent it all together. And almost half of all cancers can actually be prevented by things you can do yourself. 
to save yourself from cancer in the future. And this is a pictorial of what are these things. Exercise is really important. People who exercise have less cancer than people who don't. Maintaining a healthy weight. Obesity is one of the major causes for contributing factors to breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and others. Stop smoking is really important. Never start, or if you smoke, stop. The major reason all those cancers have gone downhill since 1975 is because of the reduction in smoking and deaths from lung cancer. You can protect yourself from skin cancer by using sunscreen, which is important for people with skins of all colors and tones. Eat a very healthy diet. And what that means is lots of fruits and vegetables, more than five fruit or vegetables per day and pick from this rainbow of colors. And the last is to get vaccines for those cancers that are preventable. There are two main anti-cancer vaccines. One is hepatitis B vaccine, which pretty much prevents liver cancer. And that's given to all infants shortly after birth. And then HPV vaccine that Liz is going to tell you about later, which should be given to all children when they're about nine or 10 years old. So that is the summary about what cancer is how it grows, how it spreads, what we can do to find it early so it can be cured, and how we can each prevent almost half of all the cancers that we might be getting. Are there any questions for me right now? Great, so uh, if you have questions for Dr. Komen, uh, put them in the chat. We don't see any um, right this moment. Oh, one of the questions is, is it, or can you make the slides available? Sure. George, you have them actually. I do, so we can. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll send them to the 100 Black men and they can figure out how to distribute. I guess one of the things, uh, your last slide, uh, let me ask you about that because you talked about, yeah, about the prevention and that many cancers are in fact uh, preventable uh, by certain things. And so I, I'd like you to just expand upon how our diet can contribute to uh, the prevention of cancer? If you can say more about that. Sure. Well, part of it is through preventing obesity. We know that cancer of the esophagus, cancer of the colon, cancer of the breast, cancer of the pancreas are all more common in overweight and obese people. The other thing is the antioxidants that are in a lot of these fruits and vegetables which make your body able to fight off those early changes, those mutations that happen. If your body is very healthy and functioning well, it can not let those mutations grow and turn into a cancer. And it also enhances your immune system so that you can fight off different toxins, for instance. And, um, the, uh, we know that colorectal cancer, which is really common, uh, people who eat a diet, and, and Rachel will tell you more, but red meat, processed meat, hot dogs, bacon, sausage, very, very bad to increase your risk of colorectal cancer. So these are some of the ways. Uh, Dr. Coleman, one of the things that, uh, that we saw during COVID-19 was how some of these comorbidities also contributed to uh, African Americans being more uh, susceptible or to COVID. I guess that's, is that the right way to say it? More susceptible. In other words, yes. The existence of these comorbidities that you describe also play the play the factor in the higher risk for COVID nineteen. And I'm wondering uh, this issue around healthcare access, uh, which is like you said, the key is getting screened. And so how do we get more people screened, so, uh, which is also functioning around healthcare access? How, we, how do we do better at that uh, so that we can um, limit or reduce these comorbidities? Yeah, this is really important. And it's a, a national priority to get rid of the inequities based on race and somewhat on uh, socioeconomic status. But 
is definitely a race-based problem that we have to solve. It's inequities that have been created by hundreds of years of inadequate health care and inadequate access to appropriate care and prevention. So small programs and big programs are all important. We have a couple of programs here at the Upstate Cancer Center, which reach out to our neighbors who live in Pioneer Homes and other Syracuse public housing locations. We have at Upstate a mobile mammography van, which travels around eight counties, providing mammograms to people who might have trouble getting to a location to get a mammogram. So there are many things that we need to do as a society, as a community, as the city of Syracuse, and as Upstate Medical University to try to correct these inequities. All right, thank you, Dr. Coleman. And we'll have more with Dr. Coleman uh, in just a, a moment. And uh, Isaiah, we'll get to your question uh, a little bit later on, but thank you, Dr. Coleman. Our next presenter is Rachel Ryan, who has a master's in public health. She does upstate community outreach. She, she does upstate community outreach as program coordinator of She, We Matter. She will discuss colon and breast cancer and mammograms. Rachel, it's all yours. Hi, so I'm gonna first discuss colorectal cancer. It is the third leading cause of cancer in both men and women, and the second leading cause of cancer death in both men and women. So what is colorectal cancer? That is cancer that begins in the colon or rectum. The colon is the large intestine and the rectum is the pathway that connects the colon to the anus. The risk factors, um, there's unavoidable and avoidable. So the unavoidable risk factors are your age and your personal or family history. As you get older, your risk of cancer does increase. It does for everybody. And if you have a family history of the disease or a personal history of the, the disease, you're more likely to get it or to get it again. Risk factors that you can avoid are your diet, if you are eating a lot of red meats, if you're eating processed meats, if you're not getting enough dietary fiber, these can all contribute to cancer. So you really wanna make sure that you're eating your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains, your lifestyle. If you are overweight, you have type two diabetes, you're not physically active, or if you are a heavy alcohol drinker, you also increase your risk for um, colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer in 2017, there was over 135,000 cases and over 50,000 deaths. Specifically in the Hispanic population, 32% died from colorectal cancer. And in the black population, 41% died from colorectal cancer. So these numbers, we really don't wanna see those high percentages because colorectal cancer, if you're getting your screening, you can find it early and you can be cured. So that many people should not be dying from the disease. Symptoms to look for, blood in or on the stool, change in bowel habits, bloating or belly cramps, weight loss for no apparent reason, tiredness, vomiting, these are the symptoms, but often there are no symptoms. And I do just want to state that if you have symptoms, you, you do still qualify for screening in certain screenings, but your screening might look different than if you didn't have symptoms because screening typically is before symptoms appear. So that's something if you're having these symptoms, you would want to discuss with your doctor, what's the right decision going forward for you. Prevention, do's, maintain a healthy diet, stay physically active, and try to maintain a healthy weight. Don'ts, limit your fried food, your fast food, your alcohol, your sugary drinks, and do not smoke. Screening for colorectal cancer begins at age 50. 
Recently, um, there has been talk about getting screened at age 45. However, it's not 100% that all insurances will cover at this age. So we're trying not to promote that too much until we know that you definitely won't receive a bill because insurance should cover all of your screenings as long as you're meeting the age requirement. And the screening tests help prevent and cure colorectal cancer found early. If you wait for your symptoms, it could mean that the cancer is more advanced and it's less likely to be curable. So that's really why you want to get screened before you have symptoms to catch something early when it's still developing. The two types of tests are the fit stool test. This can be done at home and it tests for blood in your stool. And if it does come back positive, usually then you would go and you would get a colonoscopy because colonoscopies can remove cancer early. They're called polyps, they're little growths that start to grow in the intestine and you can remove them before they become cancerous. And these tests are done every 10 years, however, if they find a polyp, sometimes you come back more frequently than 10 years. So that was it for colorectal cancer. We'll save the questions until after the breast cancer. So breast cancer, the facts. Breast cancer is the most common cancer among American women. And breast cancer is the second leading cause of death after lung cancer. One in eight women in the US will develop invasive breast cancer during their lifetime compared to one in 1,000 men. So I really, I try to put those numbers up there because we do get asked quite a bit about, you know, why is there no screening for men? And the numbers speak for themselves. It's really because the cases just aren't as common as it is for women. So that's why we really push women being screened. But for men, if you have, any sort of changes in your breasts or in your nipples, definitely talk to your doctor to get that looked at. And cancer in black women, breast cancer is the number one cancer in black women and is the second leading cause of cancer death in black women. The types of breast cancer, there's non-invasive breast cancer and invasive breast cancer. So early detection of breast cancer is the best defense because when you find it while it's non-invasive, there's a 93% chance of survival. And if you find it when it is invasive, it's only a 15% chance of survival. And breast cancer is detected at a later, more advanced stage in black women only 51% of breast cancer in black women is diagnosed at a local stage when there's more treatment options compared to 61% in white women. The five-year survival rate is lower for black women at 79% than for white women at 90%. Knowing your family history is one of the best things that you can do for your own health, um, whether that's your mother, sister, daughter, father, anyone in your family, talk to both sides of your family, your mom's side and your dad's side to find out what their history of cancers are and talk to your doctor about your own risk. And even if no one in your family has a history of cancer, you are still at risk. Most women who get breast cancer have no family history of the disease. So that's something that we do hear a lot when we're out in the community is people will say, oh, you know, it doesn't run in my family. Do I really need to get my mammogram? And you still should. You notice any of these changes? See so your healthcare provider, um, a lump, a hard knot, maybe some swelling, redness, change in the size or shape, dimpling, puckering, any sort of nipple discharge. If there's anything going on with your breast, you know your body, if, it's, if anything is off, it's better to just go to your doctor and ask them about it. So mam mammography is the best way to find breast cancer early, even when a lump is too small to feel. So if you are feeling a lump, that means you already have a symptom and the cancer could potentially be at a more advanced stage. That's why we say get your mammogram because they'll detect it before you can feel it. And women of all ages are at risk for breast cancer. However, the older 
you get, the more likely you are to have breast cancer. The rates begin to increase after age 40, and that's why the age is set at 40. You can talk to your doctor. If you have a family history, say your mother or grandmother has a history of breast cancer, sometimes they'll do what's called a baseline mammogram at 35, but you need approval from your doctor to be able to do that so that your insurance doesn't charge you. And the median age of diagnosis of breast cancer in the US is 61. Mammography saves lives. Getting breast cancer does not mean death. When found early, there's almost 100% chance of surviving breast cancer. And that's why getting screened is so important. All right, thank you, Rachel. We, thank you, Rachel. We do have uh, one question. This is about colon cancer and this is from Nasaya. As a young person, screening for colon cancer is pushed off until your 40s. As a 24 year old, what are some of the best things to do to prevent colon cancer? Should I get screened earlier or wait until my 40s to start? And you did talk about some of the things to prevent, but what about Nasaya's question, if I'm saying his name right or her name right? Um, so I would say that just to continue to take care of yourself, to know your body, to watch your, if you're really concerned about colorectal cancer, watch your diet, make sure you're staying active, maintaining a healthy weight, watch your stool, make sure that there's nothing funky is going on there that's out of the usual. And if you're really that concerned, um, discuss with your doctor uh, about why you're having these concerns. Um, Colorectal cancer does occur before the age of 50 and even before the age of 45 and 40. However, we don't screen then because the incidence is low. The problem with young people is they often don't pay attention to their symptoms and therefore it's more advanced. Uh, if you've ever read the story, stories or books by Ibram X. Kendi, he had a lot of symptoms of colorectal cancer and he didn't go to the doctor for a long time and it was already stage four and advanced by the time he found it. Luckily, he is under treatment and is remaining alive and active, but he ignored his symptoms. So this is not a good plan. Uh, thank you. Um, Rachel, another question about uh, mammography. And um, over the years we've heard mixed, I've heard, and I'm not a scientist, but I've heard mixed feelings about the effectiveness of mammography, even though we know that that is the screening for breast cancer. Can you speak to that? Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by effectiveness. Um, typically what happens is if they think that they see something in your mammography, you'll come back for additional imaging. So mm -hmm. they'll get a closer look at that spot. Sometimes they'll do an ultrasound on that spot. It could be a cyst, it could be a, you know, a fatty ball. If they're really concerned about it, they'll do a biopsy and they'll test it to see if it's cancerous. So the mammography is really the original image to make sure that everything in your breast is looking okay. Mm -hmm. I think what George might be referring to is the controversies that have been in the medical literature over the last 20 years or more as to whether mammography is effective in preventing cancer deaths. We know it reduces the chances of advanced breast cancer, that's for sure. The question is, does it really reduce cancer deaths? And the general consensus is that yes, although there are a few skeptics who can um, present literature that seem to say the opposite. We do believe strongly that mammography not only prevents advanced cancer, but saves lives. The key is to make sure that all women have equal access to mammograms and that we get everybody if we did a mammogram on everyone between the ages of 50 and 75, all women, we would find many breast cancers that can be treated. That's very important. It's no longer thought necessary to do mammograms after the age of 75. In the age to start, 50, 45, 40 is still controversial. 
Um, I have a question and then I have a follow-up question about breast cancer. So I don't know which order to do it. How about this? Uh, well, here's a, it's, it's about cancer. Let me go back to the, something that popped up in the, in the studies around the fact that uh, breast cancer when detected in black women is found to have metastasized faster and is more deadly to them. And so what do we, what do we know about that and why is that and how do we uh, account for that? Um, it's yes, access. Right. It's totally access. It's not biology. It is access. Black women have not had as many mammograms as white women. They don't have them as regularly. They don't start them as soon. They don't have the ability to get them in the sense of perhaps taking off work to go get a mammogram. Um, and they are discovered in more advanced stages because the women have not had access to equal uh, screening and mammography. The same is true with the higher death rates because the adherence to treatment protocols is a big challenge for a lot of women who are taking care of children. How can you spend a whole day in a chemotherapy chair when you have small children at home? Or again, you work in a job where you don't get any sick time, you can't get a day off, or you don't have transportation to the cancer center. You live way out in the rural communities and it's a long drive and you don't have enough money for gas for the car or your car broke down and nobody to drive you. There are many, many access issues, not just for black women, but for many people with reduced resources, but they are predominantly showing up as these worse outcomes in black women. And it is, again, it is all access and inequity and is not biology. Uh, Dr. Ryan, I'm um, Dr. Ryan, Ra Rachel and Dr. Coleman. Uh, I've got more questions, but uh, Dr. Coleman, uh, there's a message for you in the chat. And if you don't see it, uh, would you, I, I can tell you what it is, but uh, please check your chat. Please, I, I don't see it. All right, so uh, we need you to go back to the, your other mic, if you can, please. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, uh, here's the other question, Rachel. Is a vegan diet preferred to prevent cancer? A vegan diet, what do you say to that? So I don't know the statistics on that. I do know if you're, we always preach to just, you know, balance, make sure like you can live your life. You can, if you want to eat the cookie, eat the cookie. If you want to eat the burger, <laughs> eat the burger, but just make sure that you're doing everything in moderation. Mm -hmm. So a vegan diet would be more full of fruits and vegetables and lean proteins and all the things that help prevent cancer. But I don't know, maybe Dr. Komen knows actual data on vegan diet. Yeah, there's no evidence that a vegan diet is better. A vegetarian diet is very healthy and a largely plant-based diet is the most important. Small amounts of meat, especially white meat, chicken or turkey and fish are very good. Whether you have them or don't have them, you can have a very healthy diet. Um, there's no evidence that a vegan diet is any better than a largely plant-based general diet. So yeah, because and basically there's there's um I know there's a uh, the food plates I've seen the food plates and they're asking you to put more colors and fill up the plates more with uh, fresh vegetables and fruit uh, or uh, fresh vegetables and cook your food I mean I think that's the issue cook your food is what I'm hearing a lot of people say you uh, yes but also make sure you limit things um, such as you know, grilling your food, um, that could expose you to extra carcinogens that can really? cause cancer. Are yeah. you kidding? Memorial Day is coming up. Are you <laughs> <laughs> the barbecue, come on. But you're saying be, limit that, you're saying. Right, so you don't have to get rid of it, but just make sure that you're eating it in moderation, you're limiting it, you're focusing more on your healthy foods oh. and then just enjoying those foods sometimes. And if you marinate your meat before you grill it, it's less toxic. Less toxic. Okay, here's a quick question for you. Speaking of breast cancer screening, there are some people who, when getting a test, if they have it in their family history, there's a gene, I understand, and if they 
if they have that gene, some people are electing to have mastectomies because of the presence of a gene, whether they have cancer or not. Can you speak to that, please? And this would be another one for Dr. Komen. That's a very personal, um, that's not something that we typically promote. Uh, you can get gene tested and that's a personal choice, it, whether or not you want to do that. Yeah, pretty much we recommend for everybody who has breast cancer to get tested for what's called the BRCA gene. There are two of them, BRCA1 and BRCA2. And people who have these genes are very prone to breast cancer and ovarian cancer, and members of their family can also have an increased incidence of colorectal cancer and prostate cancer. So there are some women who have a very high risk of getting breast cancer, maybe a seven out of 10 chance that they will get breast cancer in their lifetime. And some of them would rather have a mastectomy bilateral both sides rather than have to continuously get a lot of checking and follow-up. And that's a discussion with a genetic counselor as well as a breast surgeon and oncologist. All right, thank you, Dr. Coleman. And thank you, Rachel. Our final presenter is Elizabeth Fuertes Binder. She is the NAB, NAPBC Breast Navigator for Upstate Community Outreach. Her topic is HPV awareness and vaccinations. Elizabeth, take it away. Well, Liz, that they call you. Yep. Thank you, Liz. Hi, thanks for having me and the team today. So today we're going to talk about what is HPV. It is the human papillomavirus. It is the most common sexually transmitted infection, STI, in the United States. It is transmitted person to person by close contact. And most people infected with HPV are asymptomatic or may not develop symptoms until years after infection. This makes the virus easier to spread. There is a vaccine against it. Human papillomavirus HPV vaccine is cancer prevention. Most sexually active females and males will be infected with at least one type of HPV at some point in their lives. Estimated 79 million Americans currently are infected. 14 million new infections per year in the United States. HPV infection is most common in people in their teens and early 20s. HPV related health problems. HPV is a group of more than 200 related viruses. 40 different types of HPV can be spread through direct sexual contact. Cases that do not go away can cause serious health problems such as genital warts or cancers, cancer of the cervical, of, of the cervical cancer, oral, oral pharyngeal, anal, vulvar, vaginal, and penile. HPV causes six types of cancers. You can prevent most of these cancers with the HPV vaccine. So you can see in this chart, um, you know, mouth and throat cancer and cervical cancer pretty, um, you know, close in the people that it's affected, followed by, you know, anal, vulvar, and then vaginal and penile cancers. Number of US cancers caused by HPV. Mm -hmm. So here you can see the female is purple, the male is blue. So oral pharynx, 10,700 has, um, you know, cancers caused in male. And cervical cancer is 10,800. So these are really the highest cancers caused by mm -hmm. HPV. Every year in the United States, 27,000 people are diagnosed with a cancer caused by HPV. This is, that is one case every 20 minutes. So this is quite a bit. Prevention strategies, vaccination. Safe and effective vaccines are available and recommended for certain age groups. Screening. Routine screening recommended for women ages 21 to 65 to detect cervical cancer. Safer sex. If you are sexually active, condoms 
and long-term monogamous relationship. HPV vaccination. Children and adults ages nine to 26 years old should get vaccinated. Ages nine to 12 protect best and need two shots. Over the age of 14 need three shots. Although the HPV vaccine has been approved to be given through age 45, it is much less effective. Talk to your doctor about this. HPV vaccine is cancer prevention. HPV vaccination is especially important for preventing cancers for which there isn't routine screening. So we're taking this, this slide shows a three dose series. So the vaccination, um, the vaccine is called Gardasil 9. There are commercials running. Um, people may have heard of this. It prevents most HPV related cancers in genital warts. It is a vaccine for males and females, nine to 26 years old, and it's best to start this vaccine between the ages of nine to 11. The vaccine dose schedule, two dose series is given, um, you know, at zero and then six to 12 months. And then if you start it later, it's a three dose series if started after the eight, at 15 or older. Vaccination prevents infection from HPV types that cause the majority of HPV related cancers. Prevents infection from HPV types that cause the majority of genital warts. And thank you, any questions? I'm happy to answer and the team is happy to answer. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> thank you, Liz. I, I'm just thinking of that. I, I, this is one of those, um, that you don't hear a lot of, that you should hear more of, given what you just said. Um, why don't we hear as much about HPV, or at least I don't hear as much about HPV. We hear a lot more about other uh, sexually transmitted diseases, but not as much about this, or maybe, maybe it's just my perception that I don't hear as much about it. So I think part of it is, you know, I know that probably for the you know last 15 years, physicians, pediatricians are speaking to families about this, but I think because it has to do with, you know, how you contract this, it's usually through some kind of sexual contact. And so I think families, you know, it's a little taboo. They think if I give my child the vaccine, it is opening the door for them to have sex. And this is not the case. This should be, you know, if you're getting the, you know, vaccines when they're babies, this is the same type of vaccine that's just given when it's older. And these are things that you can't see. You know, most people don't know a genital wart can be very small. It looks maybe like a pimple. You don't really see it, you know, in your vaginal or on your penis. And so I think because, you know, talking about sex and how you can, what happens and the responsibility about that, I think people then and parents become a little apprehensive. And yeah, I think the, the main thing, George, is that this has not been a strong recommendation for much more than 10 years. So if you're, if you have children that were beyond the age of 15 or so, uh, more than 10 years ago, um, you won't really have heard about it much. This is really for younger kids and the age now has gone down from 11 to nine. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that we, that kids at that age make the best immune response. When you get older, even as old as 15, your immune response is not as strong. That's why you need three shots if you delay till 15. So this shot is now a routine shot along with, um, meningococcus and uh, I forget what the third one is that are routinely given to nine and 10 year olds. And nobody questions um, hepatitis B vaccine being given to babies, even though that prevents a sexually transmitted uh, disease that causes liver cancer. That's not the point. The point is that this is a vaccine that present, prevents cancer and you don't have a vaccine that can prevent breast cancer, colorectal cancer, or lung cancer, but some of these less common, but really deadly and awful diseases can be simply presented, prevented by a straightforward vaccine. So most of these conversations um, go on in pediatricians offices and mostly it's not 
It doesn't need to be a conversation. It's just, this is one of the vaccines you get when you reach this age. All right, uh, Dr. Coleman. And by the way, thanks, Liz. And now we have uh, uh, our open, this is our open panel. So you can ask any of our panelists uh, questions with the time that we have remaining. So this is the open floor, Rachel Ryan, Dr. Leslie Coleman, and of course, Liz Fuertes Binder. We've got all of them available for you to ask questions to. And let's go back to the question about HPV. Um, and you sort of hinted at those, but just to uh, tie a bow around it, what are some of the greatest myths and uh, perceptions, misperceptions about HPV? Again, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to you as soon as we can. Oh, here's one. Oh, I missed that down there. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Whoever wants to answer that. Oh, I can't see it. What is the question? Oh, uh, the question was, what are the greatest myths or misperceptions, misconceptions about HPV? Oh, um, you know, I think, um, you know, will it be, I won't get it. I know my person because, you know, it's spread through sexual um, contact. And so you always have to protect yourself and really know who you are involved with and know their history. And sometimes, you know, people do not want to disclose that. I mean, this is a very personal, you know, private thing, even in the year of 2021, you see things on social media, you see all sorts of things. That's why, you know, I, I just saw a Gardasil commercial, you know, last night after, you know, I saw it on TV. And so I think now the word is getting out. So I think you have to be safe, feel comfortable, educate, you know, a panel such as this. The computer is your best friend, your smartphone. You can research it on your own and don't be afraid to ask and um, to ask questions. Um, yeah, I think that, that, that you're, this, this pretty much isn't a conversation anymore uh, for anybody who takes any kind of vaccine, these are routine vaccinate, vaccines for kids. And it's almost hard to imagine a parent who would say, I know of a way to present, prevent six times types of cancer in my child, and I'm not going to give them that advantage. It's pretty hard to imagine. You mentioned that this is something that can prevent cancer. Are there other illnesses that uh, result from HPV if not treated? That's the genital warts is the main other one. All right, another question. What are the cancer risks concerning belly fat? Is someone with a beer belly at significantly higher risk? What are the cancer risks, if any, concerning belly fat? Now I heard something around if you're the circumference of your race, waist is 40 inches or above, but that was connected to heart. So tell me where cancer fits in here. It's mostly the, the differentiation between abdominal fat and other fat is mostly for heart disease. A fat inside your belly is brown fat, which is a more toxic type of fat than the fats that, that is in like under your skin. If you have a fat under your skin in your arms or legs, that fat is not as toxic. The brown fat inside the belly is a very active uh, organ really and its toxic products can raise your risk of, of heart disease and heart disease related problems like stroke. But it just indicates obesity, which raises your risk of all kinds of cancer as well. Yeah, um, I thought it was 40 inches for men. I, I don't know what, the, what it is. Yeah. All right, uh, let me ask you this then. Uh, you talk, so let me just remind our audience that uh, we heard presentations tonight about uh, breast cancer. We heard presentations about colon cancer. Uh, we heard presentations about uh, cancer and we heard presentations about HPV. So uh, those are the questions that are on the table right now. I wanted to follow up with a question about colonoscopy. And again, African-Americans, uh, the recommendation for, was at a lower age, I thought, uh, than for, for other groups. And, and, and I, so I got my colonoscopy when I was 50 or something, or 40, I think, or 45, whatever the age, it was younger than the recommended age. Can you speak to that? 
sometimes yeah, your yeah. oh sorry go ahead Rachel <laughs> um sometimes your race does play a factor if it is known that black men do have higher rates of colorectal cancer they will take that into consideration and suggest that you get a colonoscopy sooner um did what did your doctor suggest it for you yeah um I got it or was it prostate screen? I don't know what it was, but that there are certain screenings, especially for African-Americans that occur earlier than in the uh, general uh, population. And I was right. thinking that colon screening was one of them along with prostate screening. You're, you're absolutely right. And one of the problems is that even though we have this evidence in the literature, the guidelines are very generalized. And in order to make sure that these are available to everyone, it has to be approved by the federal agency Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And it often takes them a few years to come up with the science. Most insurances now are covering colonoscopy at age 45. So that probably will be the new normal soon. It hasn't been fully adopted by the federal agencies the American Cancer Society strongly recommends it. And if you have risk factors or a family history, it can even be sooner. Yeah, um, what is the data on minority populations and HPV? I do not have um, the stats on that. We can get back to you and then you, we can send that out. I what I do know is the incidence of vaccination in the Syracuse school district is much higher than it is in the suburban school districts. So if that's sort of a proxy for income or race, it's higher. And one of the reasons we think so is because of the school-based health clinics that exist in many of the Syracuse city school district schools which make these vaccines available to kids from the school nurse, which is a very good strategy. It does say the CDC from a quick Google search says black and Hispanic women had higher rates of HPV associated cervical cancer than other races. Um, but that's all I could find right on a quick search. Right, and that again is due to lack of access to effective screening uh, women are supposed to start screening for cervical cancer, which is um, a pap smear traditionally. It's a, it's a different test now. It's actually a test for HPV because uh, people who don't have HPV don't get cervical cancer. Nuns who are celibate never get cervical cancer. But, um, but again, if if a pap smear and a visit to a gynecologist is no longer required to get birth control pills. So if people don't have the time and the motivation to go and start their cancer screening at age 21, um, you know, they can be at higher risk. So it has a lot to do with their, um, their socioeconomic status and their cultural upbringing as far as attending to preventive health care. I wanted to speak to this issue of access, but there's also trust of the medical profession as also part of the access issue. So even as we're talking about access, even people with means who are not uh, subject to some of the very things, uh, income and such and so forth, there's still this, in some ways, lack of trust. I, I say lack of trust and maybe some other things, but just this idea uh, in certain communities around the, this re, re, regaining faith, if you will, within the medical community. I think that there's some of that you're, as well. You're correct. And um, that's something that unique is unique about Upstate in our outreach programs, at least the She and We Matter programs. We do um, train leaders in the community. We call them resident health advocates and, or RHAs. And they go and they talk to their peers about these screenings so that it doesn't come from us. So they feel that it is somebody that they can trust um, and that they're giving them the right information. And then we help schedule them through these peers. The peers will meet them for their appointment. So if there's any sort of 
hesitation, they have that extra support and guidance from somebody that looks like them, that lives near them. And we found that to, that really helps. I can tell you that they are great because I've actually done some training with your resident health advisors and I love them. Uh, and they're really good at what they do. Are vaccinations available for those that don't have health care coverage? We're talking about HPV vaccinations. Yeah, basically, there are no children who don't have health care coverage in the state of New York. New York, We have the child health uh, plan. So every child has health insurance in the state of New York. If nothing else, they have what's available for children, even if the rest of their family has none. So this vaccine is available for them, for all children. There was a question uh, around whether or not you speak during health classes or whether you're in junior and senior high schools. Rachel, do you want to respond to that? I do know that um, in the past, we had somebody who was taking on the HPV initiative. He's no longer in that role, but he was working with the school districts and was very interested in having discussions in the health classes. So if that's something that you had the school and the okay to do it, I'm sure that we could get somebody to go in and talk about HPV, that that is something that we would be interested in doing. What we have actually done is what he did, Matt Capagreco, he created a curriculum which is available, approved in New York State and available to all health teachers to use in their schools. And, and Upstate um, uh, did that uh, with a round table of community members and so forth. So we have the curriculum available we, we have been pretty much on pause during the pandemic, uh, and we'll have to see what the interest and resources are in this once we get over this, but that probably won't be, we probably won't be ready for that, you know, right away anyway. Um, I, I've, I have like 10 questions in my head, but I'm going to start with this one question. Dr. Coleman, obviously we need better research as well. How do you convince uh, uh, communities of color in particular to participate in clinical trials so we can, we can get better data to get better information? That's a huge problem. And you, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> That's the trust issue all over again. Mm -hmm. um, the, it's hard. And one of the ways that we're trying to do it at Upstate is to create more doctors and scientists and healthcare workers from communities of color so they can go back and be more trusted because we know that they are. So that's a very important issue. The other is to allow, not allow, but welcome, encourage and require participation by community members in helping to make the plan for research in their community. And I think we've done a really good job with the COVID vaccine rollout in Syracuse. There've been a, a very large amount of community participation um, in the decision-making about how the vaccine is gonna be available to communities of color. So we'll see if, if, if we can get the vaccine right and the COVID testing right, that might build a little bit of trust for future endeavors as well. Well, I can tell you I've had my second dose and we'll see how it works. I just got it on Friday. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> and I'm feeling okay, just so for people to know uh, that I did get my second dose. I guess the final, I don't know if this is the final, but just uh, again around HPV and this idea of being able to prevent a cancer from occurring. I just want you to emphasize that because I think that's so critical. Um, you want it? You can go, yeah. Dr. Coleman. Liz, what's your message? Cancer yes. prevention so, vaccine. What's the <laughs> the the prevention is get the vaccine. Speak to your doctor, to your pediatrician, because as Dr. Coleman said, it should really be it's a vaccine, and I'm giving it to my child, or I'm going to receive it to prevent um, cancer. To pre Correct to prevent cancer. And I think that, I mean, that's what this is all about. There are certain things, again, we talked tonight about diet and fresh fruits and vegetables and making sure that we're watching uh, what we eat in moderation. And it's okay to have certain things, but 
I think Dr. Coleman, you said this, you know, mostly plant-based doesn't mean that you have to be a vegan or a, a strict vegetarian, but to limit your intake of, of meat and processed foods. I think I do have one more question and this is a quick one. Uh, Dr. Neil Bernard and Dr. Dean Orner say that plant-based diets will have a positive effect on slowing down prostate cancer. What are your thoughts, Dr. Coleman, with one minute to go? Well, a plant-based diet is healthier for everybody, whether they're preventing cancer or undergoing treatment for cancer. And, um, you know, I know Dr. Dean Ornish. I don't know Neil Barnard. And um, I would have to see the actual scientific evidence. There is nothing dangerous about the diet we're recommending. It reduces diabetes, it helps prevent heart disease, it has every health benefit for multiple diseases. So the fact that it could be helpful in treating anything is fine. It's not a reliable method of treatment. I have seen people who have switched totally to some kind of very strict vegan or wheatgrass diet, and it doesn't slow their cancer down. You have to combine these healthy habits with appropriate, modern, up-to-date, effective cancer treatment. Dr. Leslie Coleman, Rachel Ryan, and Liz Wettis Binder, thank you so much for being a part of the conversation tonight. And we'd like to thank you for being a part of all of our town halls. The presentations can be viewed on the 100 Black Men of Syracuse's Facebook page and on YouTube. And a very special thank you once again to the 100 Black Men of America's NIH Morehouse School of Medicine grant for health and wellness that made these town halls possible. I've learned so much. I'm sure you've learned a lot. And we ask you to please fill out the event survey so that we will know your opinions on the presentations. But I can tell you, they've been great. On behalf of the 100 Black Men of Syracuse and the NIH Morehouse School of Medicine grant, we thank you. Have a good thank day. You. Thank you so much. It's thank been you. Great to be a part of your efforts. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.